Hello again. A professor teaching during the recent festival of homiletics mentioned a phenomenon that I've noticed in my life and I've observed watching it in the sermons by people I respect and appreciate. The phenomenon is this. During the pandemic, it suddenly seems like the Bible is written for people living through just such times as we are living. As if in story after story, in page after page, there is something for those of us huddled, isolated away from family, from friends, those of us feeling uncertainty in the world. As we celebrate Pentecost together, but away, COVID is always on our minds. So when I read Acts 2 verse 1, they were all together in one place. I'm reminded that I take that for granted, or I used to. And I look forward now to that being the case again. How for this Sunday will just be another Sunday where it's getting a little less strange and I'm getting a little more accustomed to preaching online and doing the Zoom thing, but it's still another Sunday of us being dislocated. Maybe it's because our minds are distracted and overcome by the realities of our day and our questions are revolving around the topic of pandemic and so we can twist any text to help us out these days. More likely, it's because the Bible was written over a very long period of time. A period of time that, as you probably know, was dominated by economic, food, health, and political instability. An era when many didn't know what tomorrow brought, or if they thought they might know what tomorrow did, they really didn't know what the fall or the next planting season was. For them, long-term planning was far more tenuous than the sort of long-term planning we do. One sign of this is what are called the diaspora. Diaspora people are still in existence today. These are people who have been dispersed from what we and they might think of as their homelands. They're the immigrants, the refugees, Sometimes they're dispersed voluntarily, and sometimes less so. The Jewish culture has a very long tradition of this. In fact, some dictionaries claim that the very word diaspora starts with the movement of the Jewish tribes from Palestine after the Babylonian captivity. The point, of course, is to recognize that one way of life, regular places, familiar faces, rhythms we know, get exchanged for a foreign land. This makes life harder. The tricks that we have may or may not work in our new circumstances. The lessons that we've picked up might be helpful, but they might hinder us. To say nothing of the sense of shame or frustration if such a move is forced upon us. Our text this morning is about the day of Pentecost, the day the Holy Spirit swept into the church. It brought power and conviction. It would be with the church forever. Its fruits would be apparent in the lives of the individuals. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Such fruit would be the hallmark of the community, sharing, loving, merciful. The church has been far from perfect at these things, and so have we individually. But that's sort of the point of the cross, isn't it? If we could do it all on our own, then we wouldn't need Jesus, we wouldn't need forgiveness, and we wouldn't need the cross. What struck me reading the passage this year is similar to readings that I've done in the past. It goes kind of alongside them, parallel them, but it isn't quite the same. I've tended to take real heart in the idea embedded in this passage that the good news of the gospel, the spread of the Holy Spirit and the church is a global event and that no matter where on earth the person is or comes from, they are not beyond the love of God. This year I noticed the list. I know many of us glaze over a list, but in verses 9 and 10 we read Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome. That's a lot of places for people to come from. Like in an era without cars and trains and buses, this isn't easy. People have come from all over, and it turns out that this is one of the most comprehensive lists, ancient catalogs, of the Jewish diaspora. The people spread out are brought back together by God to be his people in strange times as he breathes his Holy Spirit on them. 
Verse 5 said, Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. It made me think of how unlikely our meetings are right now. Don't take offense, but there's people attending worship on YouTube or on Zoom, using phones and tablets, who normally have very little to do with such technologies. People who would argue against moving to online worship have kindly and quickly jumped on board. We have people who attend the Zoom meeting and they have phones and speaker phones so that more elderly parents can hear what's happening. Current moderator of the PCC, Amanda Curry, wrote, During the pandemic, many of us have been pushed into learning new ways of communicating the gospel, like the Holy Spirit sending the apostles to tell of the wonders of God was doing in all kinds of languages that they had never spoken before. We've also been learning new languages. That struck me as helpful and hopeful as a way to describe where we find ourselves today. We're a church that meets without leaving home. We are a church meeting in many kitchens, living rooms, and dining rooms, all at the same time. The Holy Spirit makes this possible just as much as the clever coders at Zoom do. The Spirit calls us together and gives us words for each other, brings us to pray and sing, even as we do not know what tomorrow will bring. Or if we do, we don't yet know what the fall will bring, or next year. We are spread out, and we don't know how far or how long that will be. Today is Pentecost 2020. We might particularly take heart in God's ability to act in all circumstances, calling people set apart for any reason, and diaspora, so to speak, and can work in and through them can teach them amazing things about the world and about God's love for it and for all his creatures and give them messages to take back to the various places they spend most of their lives, homes, workplaces, volunteer spaces, anywhere at all. The church has always gathered in countless places and sizes, and today we are starting to realize our global solidarity in new ways. Nadia Bowles Weber wrote a prayer recently that she shared on Facebook about the sacred during the pandemic. She doesn't name the Holy Spirit in it, but as I read it, I would love for you to think about whether she's being led by the Spirit, asking that the Spirit be recognized in her daily living under the constraints we're in. That's what I think she's doing. She writes, I do not know when we can gather together again in worship, Lord. So for now, I just ask that when I sing along in my kitchen to each song on Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life album, that it be counted as praise. And that when I read the news and my heart tightens in my chest, may it be counted as Kyrie. And that when my eyes brighten in a smile behind my mask as I thank the cashier, that it may be counted as passing the peace. And that when I water my plants and wash my dishes and take a shower, may it be counted as remembering my baptism. And that when the tears come and my shoulders shake and my breathing falters, may it be counted as prayer. And that when I stumble upon Tabitha Brown video and hear her grace and love of you, may it be counted as hearing a homily. And that as I sit at my table in my apartment and eat one more homemade meal, slowly, joyfully, with nothing else demanding my time or attention, may it be counted as communion. Even though you and I may know this holiness and the sacred nature of everything, we struggle right now, don't we? We want to be together, we love to be together, and we will be one day, but for now we need to take heart. The bishop-elect of the Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Missouri, Dion K. Johnson, found something to write. Uh, he was given this by God, I believe, and it's making the rounds of Facebook as well. It goes like this. The work of the church is essential. The work of caring for the lonely, the marginalized, and the oppressed is essential. The work of speaking truth to power and seeking justice is essential. The work of a loving, liberating, and life-giving presence in the world is essential. 
The work of welcoming the stranger, the refugee, and the undocumented is essential. The work of reconciliation and healing and caring is essential. The church does not need to open because the church never closed. We make up the body of Christ, the church, love God and our neighbors and ourselves so much that we will stay away from our buildings until it is safe. We are the church. The bishop knows that we are the church because Christ died for us and gave us a helper called the Holy Spirit. We're the church, and so at times like this, we turn to Scripture, and in John 7, we find this. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. John knew that Jesus worked out a plan on behalf of God. What he did always had meaning and purpose. So he tells the reader early on that there will be a moment when Jesus is glorified, and when that happens, the Spirit will come like rushing water on a parched land. I was at a cottage this weekend, and I was looking out at the lake, and we were waiting for rain. You could see it was going to come, and then all of a sudden, at the other side of the lake, you could see it, and you could watch it travel as it came. And you could see the lake getting more and more and more busy. You could see the water coming. It was like a blanket. And then it came upon us and it was just this torrential downpour. And I was sitting there thinking, I wonder if this is what the mercy of God or the love of God or the flowing of the Spirit will be like. When every single inch is covered. When some can stand back and watch, but you know it's coming. And then it stays, it hovers, it just downpours that love that grace, that peace, that healing. Rushing water on a parched land. And so John will write that as the disciples were huddled in fear, their king having died a shameful, embarrassing death, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He offers peace in a difficult time. We're in difficult times. He shows them his hands and his side. This is no easy or cheap peace. This is costly. This is lovingly, painfully earned. Oh, there will be struggle, and there will be many reasons for lament. And there will be peace. And from that place of peace, there will be action. This isn't some blissful peace on a mountaintop. This isn't anything completed in our lifetimes, no matter how long or how well we live. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. It is a peace that leads to sending, to going out, to going forth to working in and for the very kingdom of God. This Pentecost, we gather on Zoom and YouTube, and we meet with family and friends in strange and new ways in a new land that, while familiar, is also strange. We are not sure what it means to be sent in our circumstances, but we'll figure it out. We and the great cloud of witnesses mentioned in Hebrews have trusted and relied upon the leading of the Holy Spirit to get us this far, and the Spirit can and will take us through this moment that we are in. Let's then devote ourselves with all the church to prayer and ask the Spirit to blow anew through God's church that our little congregation, whatever church you're a part of, 
and the global church would know the feeling of the rain coming over the mountain, coming over the lake, engulfing each of us in the very love and presence of God. Father, we pray for revival. We pray for renewed spirits. We pray, Lord, that we would know you. We pray that no matter how long we've been going to church, no matter how many times we've read the Bible, be it never or be it many, your spirit would descend afresh on us, that we would be able to grasp how you are redeeming these days we are in. Lord, we look forward to times of peace and healing of reconciliation between all peoples. God, make it so. Make it so. Amen.